the first indictment, a practical denial of the sufficiency of Scripture. Over the last several decades, there has been a mighty battle with regard to the inspiration of Scripture, a battle for the Bible. But there's only one problem. When you come to believe as a people that the Bible is inspired, you've only fought half the battle. Because the question is not merely, is the Bible inspired? Is it inerrant? The major question following that that must be answered, is the Bible sufficient? Or do we have to bring in every so-called social science and cultural study in order to know how to run a church? That is a major question. 2 Timothy 3.15 and on says, And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We have come to believe that a man of God can deal in certain tiny areas in the life of the church, but when it really gets tough, we need to go to the social experts. That's an absolute lie. It has so crept into our church, our evangelism, and our missiology that you can barely call what we're doing Christian anymore. Psychology, anthropology, sociology have become primary influences in the church. It says here in Scripture that the man of God may be equipped, adequate, equipped for every good work. What does Jerusalem have to do with Rome? And what do we have to do with all these modern day social sciences that were actually created as a protest against the Word of God? And why is it that evangelism and missions and so-called church growth is more shaped by the anthropologist, the sociologist, and the Wall Street student who is up on every cultural trend. All the activity in our church must be based upon the Word of God. All the activity in missions upon the Word of God. Our missionary activity, our church activity, Everything we do ought to flow from the theologian and the exegete. The man who opens up his Bible and only has one question. What is thy will, O God? We are not to send out questionnaires to carnal people to discover what kind of church they would attend. A church ought to be seeker friendly, but the church ought to recognize there's only one seeker. His name is God. And if you want to be friendly to someone, if you want to accommodate someone, accommodate Him and His glory. Whether it is rejected by everyone else, we are not called to build empires. We are not called to be accepted. We are called to glorify God. When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritist, who whisper and mutter. This is a perfect, a perfect definition or at least illustration of the social sciences and the church growth gurus and everything else. Because every two or three years, all their major theories change. Not only on what is a man or how you fix him, but what is a church and how you make it grow. Every two or three years, there is another fad coming down the line of what can make your church into something super in the eyes of the world. Just recently, one of the greatest or most well-known church growth experts said that he discovered that he was entirely wrong on all his theory. But instead of turning then to Scripture on his knees, broken and weeping, he goes out to find another theory. They give no clear word. It says here in Isaiah, Should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Should we as churchmen, as preachers, as pastors, as Christians, should we go out and consult the spiritually dead on behalf of those whom the Holy Spirit has made alive? Absolutely not.